Right. So Deirdre, we're gonna continue with um, this session about military so I can get mine in because we're not gonna meet again for a couple of weeks. Um, next week being Thanksgiving, the week after Susan has a conflict. And so on the second, or I think it's yeah, second, second. we're gonna meet on the ninth and we haven't determined a topic yet. We Nine may at, at 12. Oh, yes. And Susan reminds us, we're going to try this 12 o'clock time on a regular basis, unless that's a problem for you and let us know if it is. Okay. So I noticed that several different wars were being talked about, and I'm going to talk about the Civil War. And this is my pedigree chart. And I have three Civil War veterans in my direct line, and that's not counting their brothers, nor brothers to some of my female direct line. And Pat has some Civil War people too. So I learned a lot about Civil War research and there's a whole bunch of different kinds of documents. So we'll touch on those. So I have a great-grandfather, a great-great-grandfather, and a great-great-great-grandfather, all who fought in the Civil War. Three different generations all in one war? Yep, I did. Now, the great-grandfather by age could have been a great-great-grandfather, um, but his son, was older when he married and my grandmother had my mother when she was 40 something and he was like 50 something. So he was like, my grandfather was really old enough to be my mother's grandfather making right. his father a, the equivalent of a great grandfather or great great grandfather. Because he's only like seven years younger than my great great grandfather. So we will begin with Gottlieb Rugi, which is, can you see my pointer there? Okay, so Gottlieb Rugi. Yeah, um, could you put it on slideshow? Because what we're seeing is oh, the overlay. Thank you. I forget to do that every time. Slideshow. From the beginning. That's better. There. Whoops. Yeah. Not yet. Okay. So just a minute. Dang. Okay. So this is the the um not leap. Where are you? Okay. So see here's my um my mother and here's her father, Ludolf. And then um, Gottlieb, who, you know, age wise. So he was born in Swiss Lake Holstein in 1834, I think it is, something like that, and immigrated um, in 1852. His rest of his family came in 1857, lived in various places, but ultimately settled in Iowa. And he joined the second Iowa Cavalry as a private, but was promoted to a saddler, which if I understand correctly, would be, you know, did the leather work involved. I think there's some shoemaker stuff in the family. Hmm. Um, also, because he was an immigrant after the war, it is my understanding that he became automatically a citizen. I don't know that for sure. I've never tracked it, but that's how I understand it. Um, let's see. Let me get his. So I have So he has a military service certificate from the state of Iowa, Adjutant General's 
department, which is what my mother, who originally did some of this early research, she got rather than from the um, National Archives and basically says, you know, he, he was um, entered the service at age 25 and was discharged in 1864, both from Davenport, um, was a saddler, served in Company E, 2nd Iowa Calvary, et cetera. Okay, but the one that's full of information is from the military muster rolls from the National Archives. And it's, um, and, and if, if you've never sent for those and you really want to know more, they're full of things. I mean, I won't read it all, but it talks about all of his enrollment and when he was out of service, um, you know, because he was ill or, you know, needed to go somewhere or whatever on detachment for this, that, or the other thing. Um, and then when he did, was discharged, how much money he was owed for different reasons. So anyway, he started off in the uh, 16th, let's see, does this one say? I think there's another one I have, but he was, he was in the, nope, that's the other one, never mind. Okay, so then there is, whoops, there is, um, Up here, we go up to, this is my mother's line. This is on my father's line. There's Edwin Bright. Okay, Edwin Bright, right. I won't be there yet. And Edwin Bright, how do I make this go down without going down a whole slide? You shouldn't be able to make it change. Because it's oh. a picture of a graph. All right. So anyway, he was born in um, May of 1842, according to my chart, but it's also really maybe 1841. And I've talked about him before several times because he's part of a good series of examples um, and part of that document detective thing. And this is where his father abandoned the family and ran off with the lady to Indiana. Uh, and, and mom uh, was declared a widow or yeah, and then she married again. Anyway, um, so Edwin Wright has a series of documents, including a grave registration which talks about a whole bunch of things. He's actually buried up in uh, near Seattle because he went, after he divorced Mandana, his wife, he was in Washington and then he remarried and for a while was in Santa Cruz. Oh. And then when, after he got elderly, he went to a veteran's home in Tennessee and then his buried in Seattle because he also lived in Seattle near a daughter. Um, but the Iowa War Department Record Survey official project number blah, 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 Works Project Administration did this graves registration thing. And so, um, ah, just a minute, there's another Gottlieb thing. Let me see, that's what I'm reading. Okay, never mind. You don't need any more Gottlieb. You got the gist of it. Edwin. Okay, so Edwin. 
Edwin had a legal guardian. He was 20 years old and males have, can't legally do anything until they're 21. So for him to enlist in the army, he had to have his legal guardian sign for him. So we already knew his father, Jacob Wright, had abandoned the family. And I'm pretty sure his mother had deceased, had died, giving maybe in childbirth. I haven't connected it, but it's to fit the puzzles. So based on the fact that the date of this guy giving permission and Edwin being 20 years, 10 months old, you could calculate that he was born in April or May of 1841, which fits with all sorts of things. Um, so that's like one of those legal documents we were talking about, Deirdre, that's not exactly a primary document, but it's pretty darn close. So anyway, um, he enlisted and it gives, this thing gives his birthplace and the date of enlistment and his age, of course, based on calculation. And um, let's see what else. And it talks about that he had black hair and light complexion, that he was six feet tall, which on the Smiths is a really, you know, big thing. But this is the same guy who also had, he, um, after he died, his wife, the second wife, got a pension. So there's pension records. And there's also invalid records. Like if, if somebody had gotten shot, they could have gotten an invalid. And those are all on Ancestry. He also claims to have been at um, uh, Andersonville prisoner of war camp, but I don't really find him there. I do find an E bright, but there's something about the record and I don't recall now what, it doesn't fit. So maybe, maybe not. Maybe he saw the name himself on the list and decided he would claim it. I'm not sure. All right, where am I on here? So his future father-in-law, Mandana Wood's father, Jackson Wood, is the great, great, great grandfather. Now, this does not show his age, but he was 40 years old when he enlisted. He didn't have to enlist. Uh, he had nine children and maybe he decided he wanted to enlist. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me see if I can get these exact. He in, enlisted in the 24th Michigan Infantry Company E. Uh, he enrolled on August the 14th in 1862 and was mustered in on September the 3rd, 1862, and died on March 28th, 1863. So seven months later, he died. Now, he died at Camp Schaefer, Murfreesboro, of infection of the lungs. So in November and December, he was convalescing at camp in Nashville. He's actually buried at, um, where's it at? He's actually buried at Stones River National Monument and so he's like in the hospital at Stones River, but he didn't actually fight in the battle because he was apparently in the hospital with pneumonia 
in November and December, but the actual battle was December 31st to January 2nd. So, and then he died in March. So technically he's part of that group, but he's buried there and we, we did go there. Um, so there's Pat walking around. You can see in the background behind the trees, there's tons of graves, unmarked graves. Nearly all of them are unmarked. I have no idea which one would be his. I have uh, more pictures of this, but I couldn't find them. So it just goes on and on. Um, so this, um, so the battle of, River. It's in Middle Tennessee. It says 12,000 people, soldiers died on those three days from both sides, I mean, you know, between the two sides. So it was a bad, bad thing. And I have one more note. Where did he go? I had some uh, Civil War notes. Ah, there it is. The Civil War in general. There was um, 625,000 lives lost. Wow. And it began on April the 12th, 1861 to May 9th, 1865. So anyway, um, so I have three Civil War ancestors and several uncle, great, 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 whatever uncles. And Pat also has um, direct line great grandfather and brother. And I don't know if he has others. I can't remember offhand. Anyway. So we have civil war all over the place. We wow. Might have revolution. We have one. Rev he has one revolutionary. I I probably do. I just not back to it. Yeah. So my my civil war are all Confederates. Huh. Uh oh. Ah. I like your dead. Cindy's laugh. Ha. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let me see if I have any. I don't think I have any more slides. Nope. That's it. Very interesting. Yeah. So you want me to unshare your screen? No. Oh, you did it. it. See, you did it. Yeah. It's just that <laughs> with Zoom, all these things, they, they like multi-layer on top of each other and stuff. So it's hard to find things. And then on Zoom, yeah. you have to move your mouse to the place. And then the icon appears of what you're supposed to click. So it doesn't help. Well, I'm doing OK if things are where I think they're supposed to be. And then when things somehow get messed up or I end up in another late place, I'm like, ah, how do I get back? Yeah, I totally understand. So, OK, so what are we doing next? What are we doing next? Deirdre? Deirdre, Deirdre I hope you're paying attention. <laughs> We're just going to sign you. I think you. we should do like a Christmas theme or some sort of like Christmas. Excellent. Yeah. Or holiday sort of like memory. I know I have a lot of, you know, memories um, or, you know, asking somebody in the family about memories or pictures or. How is, how is our, how is Christmas celebrated in our family? Maybe like in not even generations before us. Yeah. That too. We can do that. I mean, we can multi scan that out because, you know, you come from different countries. Different. Okay. So, Christmas in whatever way is meaningful for us to talk about family yeah. traditions or the funniest thing that happened at Christmas or 
what we remember about Christmas or what we know from past being told to us about Christmas or yeah. I don't know, I think, you know, whatever family Christmas. I think story. my dad has some stories about when he was growing up that he wrote in a memoir. And I think I could. There you go. That. And the nice thing about Christmas is it's one of those rare holidays that people are going to pull out a camera. So there might be yeah. some photos that exist. Yeah. Boom. Maybe. <laughs> okay. That's awesome. Piles of snow over people's houses, probably, except unless they were raised in California. I, I'm looking forward tam to Tamberly saying, I don't have much of anything, and then coming up with something really amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I think she does it on purpose. It's her father's way. The only She's thing I have is a story you've already heard, which is that that mm -hmm. question of what do you do from your country for Christmas is I told you about Michaela and then thinking she was a foreign exchange student in high school. What? No. The what? The story? Oh my God. So, no, don't tell us now. Don't There's tell us. Yeah. Okay, I'll save it. I'll save it. Well, no, because she's going to come up with something else. If she tells us now, she'll have to come up with another story of her, her sucking air out of carbon boxes. So keep in mind there are 1,200 freshmen in Michaela's class in Selena's High. Okay. So it's huge. Selena's High was huge when she went there. And she didn't, and she had been in the gate program at Washington, and half those kids weren't there. So she, was I think a sophomore before she even knew anybody in any of her classes. But she's okay. sitting in sophomore math and she's being very quiet in math because she's horrible. Why would she open her mouth, right? And so she's the quiet kid. And the only thing she would ever say in math is she'd, cor she'd correct the pronunciation of her last name. When the teacher would call roll and he'd say Petrovich and she'd say Petrovich over and over and over. And then she never talked. She didn't know anybody. So it was Christmas time and they were all sitting around talking. Oh, I remember and, this. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Let's talk about different, you know, Christmas traditions or whatever. Well, what do you eat in your family? What do you eat? And everyone's like, well, what do you eat at Christmas where you're from? What do you eat? And she's kind of sitting there and she said, well, my mom and dad eat crab and we don't like it. And we eat mac and cheese or something going, really? Because, oh, they asked her what kind of name it was. It was Lithuanian. Is this is like the first day of school, right? And so they think she's a foreign exchange student this whole time. Ah. Wow. Because what kind of name is that? Lithuanian, you know, they don't know what that is. And she's not talking. All she's doing is correcting the pronunciation of her last name. And it wasn't until Christmas when they were asking what kind of foods and they were saying, they go, wow, crab in Lithuania. And she goes, I don't think they have crab in Lithuania. <laughs> she goes, I was born at Selena Spelling Memorial Hospital. Yeah. Right around the corner. I'm here. But she was so freaking quiet and the girl with a weird last name. <laughs> finish, finish telling the story because I'm recording this and this is about the only way I'm going to get these stories is if we record them so tell us about the lemon oh Lithuanian lemonade yeah add it in oh yeah that was Samantha so probably like third grade or whatever the oh, you know, yes your heritage week or whatever at school and everyone's bringing in you know you know, what's food from what your heritage and kids are bringing in tamales and people are bringing in spaghetti and whatever. And of course, Samantha never tells you until the day of, you know, but by the way, I need, you know, 28 pieces of plywood or something. And so she told Joe, oh yeah, today we're having, you know, so-and-so and so I need to bring some food from something from Lithuania for food. Can, can you bring it at like one o'clock? And he's going, what the no. Sure, honey. He didn't know what to do. So he goes down and he gets one of those nasty bottles of that real lemon, you know, the oh, lemon yeah. juice bottle, lemon juice and sugar and water, mixes it all up, brings it and tells her to tell them it's Lithuanian lemonade. <laughs> now, lemons aren't a real probable thing way up in Lithuania. And the kids <laughs> loved it, probably because it had like 15,000 pounds of sugar in it. <laughs> and then for you all the way through elementary school they would always ask samantha can you bring in that lithuanian lemonade and I'm like, oh my God. The all culture these for kids these and their parents think that there's such a thing as lithuanian lemonade i don't think joe even told samantha that it was like pull it out of his butt and there is no such thing until she was in high school <laughs> Well, I love that. I love that story. You know, in the, in high school at Alistair High, we had a 50s day. 
we had to dress 50s. Okay, you're thinking poodle skirts and yeah. stuff like that. Well, you know, we didn't have any money. And um, I, my parents were the old age of grandparents. They were 40 when they, 40 and 45 when they had me. So by the time I'm in high school, they're 60 and 65, which is like 150, yeah. you know, ancient. So I remember telling my mom I needed some kind of outfit for the 50s. I'm supposed to wear something from the 50s to school. And she's like, well, and she pulls out a dress and it was a beautiful green dress. It looks like upholstery or something. And she says, this is what I was wearing in the 50s. And I'm like, okay, so I think I wore it to school. People are like, what aren't you supposed to be dressed up for the 50s i'm like this is the dress my mom wore in the 50s yeah, where, are your, where are your bobby socks i didn't yeah. look anything like anything for the 50s i mean i guess <laughs> if, if if michaela looked at it she'd probably go yeah yeah that was something that old women wore in the 50s yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but i was i didn't get it i didn't have the cultural um understanding i guess you know all i've done is watch happy days i think and yeah. i don't even know if i do that but i i think there's a photo of my mom in this dress i think i wonder if i have a picture of me in this dress but that's but it's kind of the same idea that things again or not this is why kids are not yeah yeah <laughs> yeah Petro, it's not petrovich it's pet Petrovich. Petrovich. Ah, oh, I've got to figure out how I'm going to remember that. Petrovich. The accent is on the P. P. No, it's on the O. P. It's the first Petrovich. syllable. It's Petrovich. It's on the second syllable. Petrov. Petrov. It's always on the next to the last syllable. Oh, Petrovich. Ivanova. Shostakovich. Oh, no, don't confuse me by saying other words. Right. No. Petrovich. 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 Tchaikovsky, Petrovich, Shashakovich. It's all. Well, my name is just two, two syllables. Gerbeck. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm screwed. Okay, so three weeks. Yeah. Christmas. Wow, you better come up with some. And you know what? Yeah, we'll, we'll be able to have, we'll, we'll be able to take more than two weeks probably to get through them. Right. I'm, I'm expecting yeah, probably. good stories from you guys. The, the ninth and the sixteenth uh, will probably is that right nine and seven I'm so sixteenth and, and and then the twenty third we probably won't meet because and we're you know if you can't come up with a story for yourself I mean something that's personal try to go far back if you can because that'd be really genealogy like uh -huh. but you could also come up with what would have been the customs of a family that like I, I would be thinking it'd be really interesting to find out what the Lithuanians really did. <laughs> or from Mary's family, what would it have been like? What would a traditional Christmas had would have been like for this family that she had that she doesn't know much about? And and if she if you research that, then of course then you're going to come up with some understanding depending on the economics of your family what it would have been like. I don't get to recycle my mother's Christmas time kidnapping story. I love that story. I'll have to record it too. I don't think we have it recorded. All right. So right. I, no, go. I think you can. She's got them. curry. I've got, yeah, I want I've curry. Got two fairly current stories I need to tell. So. Okay, well, I definitely want to hear Petrovich's story. There you go. Yes. So that so we can get it on audio somewhere. All right. Okay. All right. You guys have a terrific Thanksgiving. All right, everybody. Take care. I'll Good see job. you soon. Bye. Soon. Bye.